Um, well, welcome to the first uh, event of the 2022 year um, presented by the Geotechnical Society of Edmonton. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Albert Leo from the University of Alberta giving us a presentation on um, called the effective structure on the development of flow slides in cemented soils. Um, the GSE would like to thank its sponsors and the University of Alberta for providing today's Zoom meeting services. Please note that today's event uh, is being recorded and screenshots might be posted on our webpage and uh, social media platforms. Um, moving to the next slide here. Um, Dr. Leo is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Alberta. Dr. Leo received an MH degree in civil engineering for undergraduate studies at the University of Bristol in UK in 2011, and his MSc in civil engineering in 2016, as well as an MSc in computational science and engineering in 2019, and a PhD in civil engineering in 2019 from the Georgia Institute of Technology. A core focus in his research has been the analysis of natural and human-induced disasters. His research is centered on developing more resilient, intelligent, and sustainable civil engineering solutions by analyzing and mitigating landslides and evaluating and improving the design and performance of resilient infrastructures for post-disaster mitigation and community reconstruction. Dr. Leo serves as the co-chair of the Virtual Reconnaissance Program for Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance Gear Association, which is an NSF sponsored organization that responds to natural and human induced geotechnical disasters worldwide. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Albert and he'll give our speak for, uh, presentation for today. All right, uh, thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, uh, very kind introduction. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, um, can everybody see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and um, first, I'd like to thank you um, for the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Edmund Geo Society to invite me to uh, present uh, for this month. And then um, I hope everybody will have a very productive and a fruitful uh, 2022. So um, today's topic, I would just like to share a uh, the analysis of a failure mechanism of a particular landslide that we find we put a lot of time and effort in, and we find that it's an interesting case to share. And we also um, wanted to refer this as a uh, a bit of a framework or sort of a guidance in terms of providing a solution to understand the failure mechanism of a landslide that involves potentially flow liquefaction in a this cemented soil. So. Um, let me go ahead and do that. Okay. Right. So at the very beginning, I just want to spend five seconds on the uh, uh, on what I do and also the uh, the research group that I'm uh, currently building at the University of Alberta. I started here in well, September 2020. I would like to, I would I would like to call myself a new hire. And uh, because the all, the all the years of 2020 and 2021 seems a little bit blur. And although I've been here for almost two years now. Um, so um, my, research group, uh, my research group deals with uh, uh, potentially three themes and um, that includes the disaster reconnaissance moving on you know, from the very beginning when that happens or during the monitoring stage and when you anticipate something to happen and then move on to the failure analysis. You uh, try to figure out and understand the failure mechanism through a different geotechnical analysis approach and then all the way down to the mitigation and resilience, how to improve the future design, how to improve the existing uh, uh, resilience of the community that potentially uh, are being impacted or will be impacted uh, by this uh, upstream uh, disasters. So uh, in today's talk, I'll try to focus on um, uh, this particular landslide or this rather this particular type of landslide that I will, we will observed in this uh, particular study area. And it's an interesting case because we have uh, seen a lot of landslides in that area and a lot of that landslide occur there uh, are actually flow slides that involve this potential failure mechanism of, uh, of static liquefaction or flow liquefaction. So we will be moving uh, in a sort of a logical 
order, starting from the field investigation and move to the lab investigation, both the larger strain deformation and the small strain deformation, trying to understand different aspects of these mechanical properties. And moving on, we want to do, uh, discuss the results of a physical modeling using centrifuge model to understand or better understand the deformation process of that landslide. And then trying to uh, verify our speculation or our hypothesis and at a different aspects regarding to the deformation process and potentially the onset of flow liquefaction in that cemented soil. So um, why landslide? And if you look at this particular slide, that landslide, um, according to the, uh, 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 the, the UN uh, ISDR, and um, if you look at this particular uh, uh, type, of land, uh, type of disasters, a landslide sort of lies right in the middle. And you can see here, if you can see my pointer, and that is landslide. And that's about 5.2% of all the number of disasters that, uh, that has been documented from 1998 to 2017. So it's right somewhere right in the middle. And you, you, you see that. So, okay, so obviously we have a lot of problems when it comes to flooding and a lot of problems when it comes to uh, 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 hurricanes. So why landslide? Of course, earthquake and also uh, lies way uh, uh, above that, uh, uh, um, the, you know, the landslide in terms of priorities based on this figure or this number here. So why landslide? So now if we move on to look at the, all the, the fatal failures that has occurred uh, caused by landslides and from 2004 and 2010, that this particular figure was, uh, was released uh, uh, back in 2012, I believe Dr. Patley released another one and just a sort of updated version of this figure. So this figure is slightly outdated. And this is not, a, by no means, this is not a, a comp, this is not a comprehensive fatal landslide inventory uh, during that period of time, because a lot of the, uh, for example, the, uh, the earthquake induced by the 2008 uh, Wenchuan earthquake in Sichuan, China was not, uh, uh, was not uh, documented in this particular map, but still, it gives us an insight into what happens and how uh, destructive and damaging those landslides can be on a global scale. And so on this particular map, you see like more than 2,000 fatal landslides has occurred uh, between 2004 and 2010, and they're responsible for more than 30,000 fatalities. And you can see from this figure, the majority of that is uh, concentrated along the, the Himalaya uh, the Himalayan Alps, as you see here, in the high Asian area uh, in general. And so if you, uh, now, if you look at it, uh, the US, if you look at it, the US here, moving my cursor to over here, and you see just from the figure, you see the impact might be less, uh, less catastrophic. And on average, um, based on the data set we have, on average, 25 to 50 people are killed by landslide each year in the US. Not the literary life, but if we compare the fatalities, we have on average 80 people that are killed by tornadoes each year in the US, and on average 17 deaths that are related to hurricane. So this, again, this figure is showing an incomplete data set of fatal landslides, okay? So um, in the case of Canada, um, it is also an important issue because even though you look at the figures, okay, you see, even less uh, these black dots on the on the map, but it is still an important issue because according to the Canadian disaster database, that landslide have killed uh, more Canadians than floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes since 1900, and it is still causing 200 million to 400 million uh, dollar in damage each year. So it is a problem, and if you look at simply the how destructive the landslide can be per square meter. And I would say that as compared to flooding and the tornado events, we still have a lot of room for improvement. So for this particular, uh, moving on to this, uh, now dealing with a particular aspects of landslide, which is we do have different types of landslides. And uh, the late Professor Hunter in 2014, in his landslides uh, paper that he uh, uh, we summarized and uh, devised uh, 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 this category. We, which I would, uh, I would like to uh, uh, to draw your attention to this one because I'm really interested in this particular type of movement called the flow. Now, uh, the Professor Hanna did not provide a particular definition on uh, flow, but he did provide a, a lot of sub uh, subclasses 
inside that category and provide individual definitions for them. So, but if you combine those uh, in the individual definition, that you can generally characterize this flow movement as a rapid to extremely rapid flow, like movement of granular materials at a dry to saturated state. So, i.e., with or without the development of excess pore pressure, and this can happen uh, on land or on the sea. Right, and I'm sure by this point that all of you on this presentation have seen this video, and if not five times, then certainly at least uh, 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 at least twice. And we've all seen this video because this is from the Bermudino uh, dam. It was the failure was captured by the CCTV uh, camera, and as you can see here, and this phenomenon, this phenomenon video really showcased the two. Uh, key characters of the flow like landslides, which is the, uh, the rapid deformation and movement, as well as the long run out and the far reaching impact. So, this is at the onset of the failure, and it, it quickly propagates and started to move downstream. And just to give you a perspective, uh, if you have noticed that, that how fast the train are, are, are going and how fast the car are going, and uh, relatively, you can look at that the movement of the landslide is very quick. So first, uh, for this particular landslide, let me uh, give you a little bit information about this particular soil and uh, also the field condition and the study area. So uh, the particular soil that we deal with is called uh, Lois or Lus, and depending on the, um, where, you, uh, where you're from, you call that slightly different name. But uh, either way that you can find them um, pretty much uh, in a lot of places on this planet, and it covers about 10% of the land area uh, on Earth. So as you can see, you can find some of them in the, uh, in the East Europe, and you can find some of them in China, and also in the middle of the United States, and you can find some of them in the South uh, America. Those are the key sort of the concentration of this particular soil lowest. And if you move on, and um, this is the uh, uh, a, a particular region I wanna, uh, uh, I wanna be focusing uh, on today, which is the, the Chinese lowest. And so the problem with lowest is, is, is it is a very strong material when it's dry, but it's the moment that it touches water, everything becomes problematic. And so because, um, because of its structure and because of the desementation. So what happens is the particles are bonded by a cementation agent, and those are typically uh, by salt. And if they are dissolvable in water, then what happens is that it will uh, dissolve and the bond will disappear and the particle will have to rearrange themselves and this will cause sudden collapse and due to that rearrangement. And if you see, uh, if you, I can uh, direct your attention to the figure to the very left and you can see this is a, uh, a map of the uh, distribution of those and um, based on how fine the material is. And if this is the source area, which it is, and if you believe that the loss is being uh, deposited by transported and deposited by wind, so the far it travels and the finer the material becomes. And then since the heavy materials tend to fall down and be deposited uh, closer to the source area. And so if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, 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 the grain size distribution curve, um, either, even though you have three different sort of class of uh, lowest, you have the clay, silty, and sandy. Uh, loss uh, by default is predominantly silt size material. And you can see that some of the particles that are bonded by this, uh, the salt bridge or the cementation bridge. And if you zoom in really closely from your SEM, and you will find that this is, uh, uh, this is what the cementation agents or the interparticle bonding are from. So uh, the study area that I, want, uh, that I want to discuss today is in China. You can see that is not too far away from the edge of the Tibetan Plateau. It's sort of the right in the center of the map here. And what you can see here, this is, uh, 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 this is created by a UAV scan over this large uh, area. And so the size about this, the size of this terrace, the size of this terrace is about 12 kilometer or square kilometer. And if you uh, minus the margin of all the landslide that it happened in the, the surface area along, it was a, uh, it is about nine uh, um, um, uh, square kilometer. So this terrace has a, a fairly simple uh, geological profile, and it has on the very top you have the last 
uh, you have the silty loads layer and uh, beneath that you have the clay layer which forms an impermeable layer uh, sitting below the uh, the overlaying uh, lowest layer and you have a gravel and you have the bedrock so uh, the, 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 there are residents who has been moved to this area and, and due to an upstream uh, hydropower station construction. So they settled down here in around the 1960s. It's really kind of started in 1968, where they have the, the settlement and started to, uh, uh, to do, uh, do, you know, have the agricultural activities and where that is when the irrigation program started. And ever since, they have been problematic because of this community has suffered a lot by the landslides caused by the terrorists and potentially induced by the irrigation process. So what happens is that in, uh, since, since 1968, more than 200 loss related landslides have occurred on this terrace. And the groundwater level has been, uh, has been uh, increased of, at a striking uh, speed of 0 point, uh, roughly 0 0.2 meter per year. And then the slope retreat caused by the landslide on the surface of the terrace has been about, is costing about 3% uh, of the terrace area, surface area per year between 2005 and 2017. So if the, if the landslide continue to develop on this terrace, eventually this terrace will vanish sheerly because, merely because of the, 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 the repetitive of the landslides uh, due to potentially the irrigation process. Now, what we do find that interesting is that in the past, there were not a lot of landslides developed in this area, we call that the S2 area. And now we see a lot of landslides and particularly flow slides being developed here. And if you can see the map here, and here is, uh, we decided to figure out what happened there. And we will find that it was actually due to the irrigation intensity or the irrigation cycle. Uh, and that would, that depends on what kind of crop that you are uh, that you are producing over the area. So if you have vegetables and or fruits, then they demand more irrigation. They demand more water. So you irrigate more naturally. And what happens is that you increasing the localized groundwater more, and that you causing a, a concentration of groundwater level uh, in this particular region. And you will find that most of the flow slide concentrated in S7 and S2. So here is kind of a zoom in of what is happening in S2. And this is uh, again created by the UAV scan that we did. And you can see this, this is called the DC number two landslide and the DC number three. We'll be focusing on the DC number two uh, for today. And because this is an interesting landslide that occurred in 2005, it does have the main characters that we, uh, we are interested uh, for this particular type of uh, flow slides that developed in Lois. Right, so this uh, particular type of uh, uh, flow slides, we call this retrogressive low flow slide. And what happens is that, well, first let's define what flow slide that we, 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 uh, we mean here. So basically it's the failure surface develops entirely within the overlay um, lowest layer and it's large to medium scale failure with rapid movement and the long run out uh, with liquefied and fluidized the flow behavior of the landslide when it moves. So, and the, retrogra the retrogressive in this means basically that this landslide keep repeating uh, behind the previous scar of the previous landslide. So uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is extending behind the previous uh, scar and uh, once one landslide or well, one failure at a time. So here, if you look at it, this case, this is the pre a landslide image uh, it was from 2015 and uh, January 2015 and then three months later that when we, uh, when the team went back to do a scan and uh, they took this picture and they find that was the landslide has occurred and uh, but they actually document they have actually some attempt to try to document that 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 or monitor that failure before it happens because the local uh, the local community the, the, the village people who actually told them this landslide seems to be moving because the cracks is becoming larger because they were doing irrigation there. So it was human activities on top of that. So, and then they actually did some markers, very preliminary markers to measure the relative distance of the, of the crawl movement of that landslide. And when they found that before April 29th, when the, the landslide actually occurred, uh, from January 7th, uh, sorry, January 9th, and they were actually measuring the relative movement of the markers they placed on the ground. And they find, yes, the ground is moving, the crown is moving, but it was no way 
uh, sort of trying to indicate this is an imminent failure is upon us. And so when the when when day 100 was in, you know, I think it was 103 at that time, and before 110, when uh, less than a week when they did the last measurement, suddenly the 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 the, uh, the slope uh, failed, and then it failed in a such a catastrophic manner, and it failed at roughly 7 a.m. in the morning, and the village people were uh, many of them actually witnessed the event, and they told us that the it was shut, it was over sudden, and it just failed and it moved on really quickly. And then they have multiple slides follow afterwards. So uh, here is the, just to show what happens in terms of the groundwater seepage before every, uh, every failure cases. So here is another uh, uh, um, flow slide that we find that are, are on that terrace. And you see some of the salt coatings being deposited. That is because the groundwater is seeping through the, uh, the, 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 the slope. So when you have seepage, that brings out the dissolved salt and deposited the due to evaporation on the top of your slope, on the or rather on the surface of so. And it, as you see, this is keep moving. This is the first landslide, and this is the second. So it's keep developing behind the scalp of the previous landslide. And then you move on, and then you find this. Uh, now we have this is from the Google Earth image, and now on the right hand side you have a set of pictures that we actually took from the UAV scan, and you find that yes, it was indeed you see this scalp, uh, this is there's a spring line of seepage, and then you see this uh, deposition of the of the salt coating, and then nine months later you see this is another landslide developed. You can see this is the old highway, no, no, not highway, sorry, local road. And then this is now, uh, the, the, that's the existing uh, uh, road and now is no longer there anymore. So now a lot of them speculated that, that this has something to do with the flow liquefaction. So uh, I'm a geotechnical engineer, but I was trained by engineering geologist at the very beginning of my PhD. And uh, naturally for me, I was trying to challenge their speculation. And I said, you know what, I'll, I'll investigate. It's probably not the flow slide. Uh, sorry, not, not flow slide, but not flow liquefaction induced flow slide. And so I started to work on just trying to understand the, 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 the experimental behavior, the mechanical behavior in the, in the laboratory setting. So I did a lot of on grinder tests. So before I do that, um, why uh, I, I, I might be a mirror just to quickly go through what flow liquefaction is and what, the, what we've been talking about, about the flow liquefaction in this days. So which is the flow liquefaction uh, is a sudden loss of development of larger strains accompanied by the increasing of pull pressure on the monotonic loading resulted in flow failure of the slope. And you can see the image uh, to your right, you can see that it's a very diffuse failure. It's not a, there's, you can't see a visible uh, development of a shear band. And now if we move on, I, I, I took this uh, slice from, uh, 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 Pete Robertson's uh, uh, presentation last year, oh, sorry, two years ago now, 2020. And uh, what he did was actually, he was trying to talk about, he was trying to summarize the key characters about the tailings material um, with a, their association to the flow liquefaction. And you can find that this is the, you know, tailings in his presentation, this is all about tailings. Everything, the bullet points are here. Uh, uh, Dr. Robertson was talking about tailings, the young geological age, the plastic, the low plasticity, the little and no stress history of very loose contracting material. Everything here that he discussed about tailings that material actually applies to the lotus as a soil. And now this becomes a little bit interesting. So I started to do a lot of undrawing the test. And then you, what we did first, we try to understand what exactly happens to, you know, during the dissipation process or what exactly the difference between cemented and de-cemented, i.e. the effect of structure. So we're trying to compare the mechanical behavior between intact, which is the natural loss, and the reconstituted, which is the destructive, and uh, a compacted uh, 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 during the, the wet compaction when you're preparing the sample. So what we did find here is that uh, it's a very intense uh, strain softening occurs during undrained test for both intact and reconstituted soil. And you see, for the natural soil, a lot of the large pores that was uh, uh, inherent in the natural soil actually disappears after the after the, the undrained shearing, which is kind of, of course, you expected that to happen. And now move on. If you look at that, the re, the, the intact and the reconstituted spit actually gave us a two different critical state lines. They have a tiny offset here. When I say tiny, it's not so much when you see figure, but if you look at the number, it's only about 
0.1 ish in terms of void ratio, vertical, vertical offset. And however, that gives a tremendous trouble in terms of fit that into the framework of critical, uh, critical solar mechanics. And also another observation that we made is that there, we have not observed any true liquefaction. When I say true liquefaction, that means Q and P prime are approaching very close to zero. We did not see that happen. So it didn't lose all of its strengths, but, but in terms of a liquefied shear strength for, so, uh, for, for lowest, it is very, very, very low, but not zero. And we did observe state dependency, which means that depending on the void ratio and the stress level, they behave slightly differently. And so uh, um, what we see here that if you do have a offset of your critical state line, and you, meaning that you have a two set of critical state line for intact and reconstituted respectively, what happens here is if you, your intact critical state line lies above the reconstituted one, which is, which is understandable since it's less compressible, and you, after consolidation at the beginning of shearing, you end up having, because a very robust resistance from the structure to the compression, you end up having for the intact sample a higher state parameter as compared to its counterpart, the reconstituted version of that. Which means because of its structure, at a certain stress range, your intact structure, due to its cementation, supposed to be stronger, end up becoming weaker and more susceptible to flow liquefaction as compared to its reconstituted case. And that is very interesting. And now, moving on, not all last area observe the flow slides. They all have irrigation, but not everywhere in terms of flow slides. So what happens? Now, look at the effects of grading, effects of fines content on this. If you have a high fines content versus low fines content, what happens to that mechanical, uh, mechanical behavior? What we find here that in terms of sandiness, which means that you actually have a higher uh, amount of sand content in it, but not exactly your sandy material less. It's still a silty material. And so if you manipulate the fines content in your uh, reconstituted soil, what you find that you basically, depending on the fines content, you generate a different uh, uh, critical state lines correspond to different fines content. And you see sort of a reverse trend, which has been reported in many literatures. And this is based on the E, which is the global average of your void ratio. However, if you want to better characterize that, and if you want to do a, uh, 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 what do you call that, the, uh, the interfined, the equivalent interfined border ratio, which is used for fine grained contact dominated soil mix, and given the threshold of 55%, what you find is actually those different uh, critical state lines actually merge together. They will, you will find one that is, that is good enough to actually characterize all this range of the fines content, except for number five, which is number five, is that you have extremely low fines content, which is lower than the threshold fines content that it can be merged into this uh, into the same critical state line based on the the, the equivalent interfine word ratio. And of course, if you now we were looking, we were talking about the reconstituted. Now, if you put the intact into that, you will find that uh, as your the fines content increasing to about ninety five percent even 96% that you will find that it becomes to uh, sort of starting to move, starting to move either uh, in, the, in the sort of a rotating movements as you see here in this figure. And now with that, um, uh, what we devised that was based on a, a existing uh, modified state parameter, we proposed a new criteria for this particular type of soil. And we compared it with our data and other people's uh, data, we will find that this flow liquefaction can be successfully captured with, by the modified state parameter if you have a modified state parameter that is greater than 0 0.035. And what is that? Is that what, so what's the difference between state parameter and the modified state parameter? So the modified state parameter actually has this, uh, this, this uh, parameter or, or, or that takes into account of the, uh, the relative position in terms of your x axis, i.e. your confining stress. So that gives you a bit of a control um, on both the y and the x directions in terms of how to characterize your state parameter. And so based on that, what we find um, is you can see, if you look at it, this particular, uh, so I'm just listing all the data here, but if you look at it, this 
uh, combining stress of 100 kVA, what you find that you can find this, uh, for example, this triangle, this gray triangle here, which is this part, which is the, the, the dilative behavior that we uh, deliberately uh, uh, devised for a reconstituted sample. And if you look at this arrow mark here, sorry, this add, uh, this add mark here is right on the uh, 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 edge between the non-flow behavior and the limited flow behavior or temporary flow instability. And you can find this indeed exhibited a very temporary uh, flow instability. And then uh, later subsequently, it moves back and travels upwards along the critical state line. So it does have this very subtle uh, uh, flow, uh, in temporary flow in instability was actually captured as well by the boyfied state parameter. So, uh, it's difficult to compare uh, uh, intact and reconstituted. Why you actually do need that to access the difference uh, between the what to access the effects of structure. So what we find here is we have to use something else rather than just purely uh, uh, you know experimental data because uh, you can never compare them because you can never compare the intact versus reconstituted with the same state parameter. So what we did here we used the north end to. to uh, to calibrate our material and to compare the intact versus reconstituted. Uh, we, ca we calibrated the intact and the reconstituted sample separately using the North Sand model, and, but we set them to be having the same state parameter, and we want them to be shared under undrained condition and compare their behavior directly. And so, as you can see here, I'm listing the, uh, all the parameters that we used to, cal uh, to calibrate those uh, uh, those parameters and then, uh, sorry, those uh, in the model, the parameters in the model, and and we have to make some approximations. This the north end is not perfect when it comes to a cemented material, so we actually have to uh, create a artificial OCR of one point six. We can see this this linear elastic strain path. That is what it happens, and the, so we created the artificial OCR to better fit the uh, better represents the data here. And, and we, what we find here is that now after your calibration, then you compare your, uh, your soil, your intact versus reconstituted at the same state parameter, you will find that this happens, which means at the exact state parameter and everything else being equal, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, your peak strength for your intact soil is slightly higher. However, the post peak strength the post peak strength for intact soil is considerably considerably less than the reconstituted version of that soil. Everything else being equal. So, is it as you can see here? This the, the the value is about even half less than the reconstituted sample. All other facts being equal, and then this rapid reduction, which which for this particular for the intact soil case, it, when when this rapid redu reduction of stress happens. So the development of excess pore pressure is needed to maintain a equilibrium when the long, when the when the stress has been mobilized and mobilized and mobilized and less and less can be mobilized. It has to be compensating for maintain a equilibrium. Therefore, large strain needs to be developed, and that gives you the failure, and then subsequently the more global flow failure of the landslide. And which means that failure can propagate at the beginning of a particular location all the way, uh, all the way to other directions, uh, potentially upwards and causing the failure. Now, what exactly is desementation? What happens to the desementation? I mean, we talk about the dis desementation uh, and the effects of structure all the time, but what happens to the desementation? What the consequences of that? So in order to understand if in the event of desamination or after desamination, you actually have the intact and reconstituted soil to be roughly the same material due to wetting. We devised a, a test to do so. We measure it. Um, uh, most of the tests in the past that has been very uh, uh, image based. You, did, uh, you either look at the SEM scan you, or look at uh, the CT scan to characterize the microstructure before and after desamination or before and after wetting because wetting causes desamination. And so this time we de decided to actually introduce the, the, the using the elastic wave, using the shear wave and the compression wave to measure the small strain behavior to understand their stiffness change. So now this is the, the well, this is the, the apparatus that I designed and we basically put the soil block, the intact soil block 
um, which is very critical. And you can see here, if you have your bender element for the, your shear wave that is have a, a large sort of intrusion, that will cause a stress, a stress concentration that will actually, actually cause the entire uh, 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 loss or lowest block inside of that, uh, your odometer cell to collapse or to break, basically. And since the intact soil uh, of your lowest is, is almost like a soft rock, you actually, in order to fit your intact soil into your loading cell, you actually have to use a very fine sandpaper to uh, polish that layer by layer, uh, very, very slow process to make a sample that actually fit perfectly or uh, perfectly enough inside your loading cell. And, and then you do it in order to do the test. So basically what we did, we loaded cell in 1D consolidation uh, uh, loading cell. And then we, uh, for the intact of the soil, we actually introduce inject water to wet the soil causing the sanitation. And for the reconstituted, we just load and measure with the velocity and we, and we do unload. So for the intact, we have another uh, uh, wetting here that we introduced. So um, what we did, we find that the, uh, the velocity changes, obviously, during the wetting process. And the more interesting, we find that for the shear velocities, if we look at it, we, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about more about the shear velocity since it doesn't really affect it by the, the, the existence of pore water, since the shear wave doesn't really propagate it in the water. Um, so uh, just for the sake of time, I'll be focusing on the shear velocity here. And as you can see here, here is the intact soil. Here's the intact soil, and we should have a much higher shear velocity at the very beginning during the compression process. And after you keep loading and keep loading at one, roughly one megapascal, uh, you introduce water into the system and cause the soil to collapse, i.e. desamination. And when that happens, the velocity, the velocity, the shear velocity that characterizes the, the contact level deformation drops tremendously and join the group of the reconstituted shear velocity, which also reflects the contact level deformation. So the contact level uh, deformation, i.e. the small strain stiffness of the, your of your soil sample, of intact soil, has been compromised. And in terms of the shear wave velocity, it becomes very similar to your reconstituted soil. The reconstituted soil, I should emphasize, the reconstituted soil, the reconstituted soil that is in comparison here was never wetted before. It was purely mechanically disseminated. It was never chemically disseminated. Was no mineral, no salt has been dissolved in those reconstituted soils. It was mechanically uh, damaged, destructed, and compared here. And so now if you look at the figure here that uh, um, I just want to go through very quickly. So at the beginning, when you have an intact soil that you'll find them is more or less uh, behaving in terms of the velocity characters or parameters, it behaves almost like a, a, a softer rock. And by the time the dissemination or the structure occurred, it is now joins the, uh, the clay or the, even the fly ash region in terms of its uh, wave velocity parameters as you can see here. And therefore, uh, uh, based on the uh, this change or this trend is, is, is I, I think is, uh, uh, it is not a dangerous thing to, 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 to postulate that there might be a in-situ cementation control the region in terms of the velocity and reflected by the velocity in terms of uh, the, the, the vertical stress. And then move on, you probably have a stress cementation control the region in terms of stress. And when your stress is finally large enough, the cementation may does not matter anymore in terms of your wave velocity. Now, we've learned about the larger strain deformation, but the small strain deformation. Now let's look at what does actually happen. So we learned that, okay, loss or lowest can liquefy, but not to the point that it completely loses the strength. But in terms of flow liquefaction, what does that do to your landslide? Or what does that do to your slope? So uh, if, let's go back to the field for a few minutes. And then if you look at it, the field here, if you're kind of brave enough to rope down to the scarf and take a water sample, take a soil sample one meter at a one meter interval, and then you take that back and measure the water content, you will find that actually you can verify that the water level uh, behind the scarf 
is considerably or significantly, actually, I should say, higher than the water content along the, uh, the two sides or two flanks of the landslides. And we can see here, and the, the water content behind the scarp has the same water content uh, of what jumps, uh, uh, jumps around about 10 meters higher than the, uh, than, the, than the water content along the two flanks, which means that the, the, because of the, 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 local the, the local geometry, the water content here behind you, directly behind your scarp, actually is, the water level here is higher. Okay, so the, the, uh, now uh, back to my putting my uh, engineering geology uh, uh, hat on, uh, which we're, we try to conceptualize a failure mechanism or failure model. And what we find here is that well, we, since we, we know we have surface irrigation, and then we know we have an increase in groundwater level. Since at the very bottom, below the uh, beneath the, 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 the lowest layer, we have this impermeable clay layer, and now so, so we have an increase in groundwater table, and then we do have cracks, vertical cracks that are uh, a very common and typical uh, thing in the in the last region, since it has a very uh, low tensile strength as compared to the compression. And um, what you can see here is that at the very beginning, when nothing happens, you have a system sort of in equilibrium. You have the surface irrigation, you have the uh, tensile cracks, and you have the surface discharge that occurs at the city. We see the screen lines. And then continue with the irrigation, you have a continued increase of the groundwater table. And when that happens, finally, when the groundwater table becomes high enough, that little uh, uh, disturbance in the axial uh, deformation may cause may cause the, a very localized uh, propagation of your crack and causing a localized failure. And that is happening actually under a drained condition. So we call this sort of a sliding failure just to give it a different name. And so what happens during this first failure is that first, that this particular drain failure is uh, uh, it's very localized. It's not going to be large in size and it's not going to travel very far. This is what we observed in the field. And when that happens, this localized failure can actually incidentally fall and deposit right on top of the previous seepage point. That's number one. And number two, when that happens, you introduce a natural new hydraulic gradient behind the scarp. So the groundwater from, uh, from, from, from the surrounding area, we are trying to converge into behind that a new uh, hydraulic gradient, um, i.e. behind that a new scarp. And when that happens, you essentially causing a drained to undrained transition at this very localized area. And when you do that, if you are putting your element in a triaxial device and you do a test, and you shear your sample along the drainage path, uh, a drain the loading path, and then you close the valve and switch to undrain. That will cause an immediate reduction of your strength. We've all seen that before, but in the field, what does that look like? And you can see this video here. That is uh, me doing a very sophisticated uh, hydraulic, sorry, dynamic, I'm trying to, I can't use the, uh, ah, there we go. And doing a very specific um, um, dynamic, the dynamic loading test that you can see here. If you're standing uh, in, on this red circle and on the landslide area, on the display, essentially on the displaced material, and that is what happens. You see, uh, it's a very, a very high water content. So the seepage point has been blocked and water is trying to seep through those displaced materials. And this is not just uh, only happening in this particular spot. It's actually everywhere when you uh, when you stand on the displaced material. All right. Now uh, moving on. So in order to better understand the deformation process, we decided to do a centrifuge test on that. So what we did is to, uh, 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 well, for, for, for the people here that are not particularly familiar with the centrifuge, the idea of centrifuge is actually not that complicated. So back to the, back to the Newton's law of motion, F is equal to M times A. Um, in the lab, obviously you have a limited M. You can't keep increasing the M. So with the centrifuge, with the help of centrifuge, you can keep increasing the A to simulate the F 
in the field. So by creating this uh, centrifuge acceleration, you are increasing the you are increasing in that formula the a um, in order to simulate the uh, the amount of desirable uh, or what are the desirable value of force that you require, and therefore that is the uh, essentially that's what's happening in the uh, in the centrifuge tests. So we made this uh, model slope and we put it inside the centrifuge chamber and then we decided to spin it, and we have uh, sensors installed at the different locations, uh, pore pressure sensors and earth pressure sensors mainly, and we are uh, monitoring the water level increase behind. The, the behind the slope. So we have a water tank here and we have an inlet. This is to simulate the uh, propagation of irrigation that is happening at the center of uh, the terrace and the groundwater propagate from the center or from the sort of somewhere around, you know, along the, everywhere on the surface because that's, you know, the irrigation is not happening just in the center of that terrace. It's happening everywhere on the surface. So basically the propagation of the theatric surface to the, to, the, to, the, to the edge or the margin of the terrace. So i.e. to the edge of the slope here uh, near the toe. So we're trying to, uh, during the early phase of the, during the early phase of the centrifuge, we lacked the propagation uh, of the theatric surface to, to dictate uh, our, uh, our, uh, our deformation process. So uh, let me show you what is happening in terms of what we're trying to do. So the hypothesis is that we have a drain failure at the beginning, which is the first failure. And the drain the failure will change the geometry of the slope near the toe area specifically. And we'll, that will create a geometry that will create a base of a slope that is more prone to liquefaction and with a build up pore pressure, uh, pore water pressure. So you have a geometry that is more susceptible to flow liquefaction. And if you have a continual increase in groundwater level, that will make your slope more susceptible to liquefaction. That's number one. And number two, we want to show that the groundwater perturbation at that uh, time uh, before the sec before the onset of the second, i.e. the flow liquefaction occurs, uh, that the groundwater perturbation is a key to the stability of the base. And ultimately, that can lead to the flow liquefaction under ungrained condition. So this is the goal. And of course, for the first one, if you do a very, uh, uh, if you do a, um, a classic F, uh, uh, LEM analysis, you can understand that this, um, by increasing the water table and changing the slope of geometry at the same time, it is not harder to understand that you will have a reduction in the, uh, in the, in the factor of safety if you already have that, uh, uh, that the slope at the equilibrium, uh, at the unity, close to unity at that time. So this uh, particular change will just introduce and propagate uh, uh, even a more intensive uh, uh, landslide. So uh, now moving on to the basically what happens uh, inside of that uh, centrifuge chamber. So I'm trying to show this, and this ah there we go. So this is the uh, uh, this is the you see this black line here. That's the propagation of the theatric surface at the very beginning. And once it reaches the toe, and the slope becomes to deform very slowly, and then you will see a little bit of quicker. You once you continue to increase, once you continue to increase the uh, the groundwater level, uh, because in the field that's what people do, irrigation, and that will cause a more rapid uh, failure uh, afterwards. And you see from the scan here. So. Now you can see here, so I just want to basically go through uh, this, uh, that in a little bit of detail. As you can see here is the, uh, the, 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 the propagation at a different time of the theatric surface profile overlaying the original slope profile. So uh, around 18 minutes. So this test actually lasted very long. Uh, well, very long in the centrifuge modeling sense uh, because uh, we, we need to wait the, the, until the, propag the, 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 the propagation and the stabilization of the groundwater table. So well, that's basically what we did. And what happens here, once the groundwater level reaches the, the toe of the area uh, of the slope, the, the, uh, um, um, it becomes uh, a very, uh, it makes the slope to uh, move very, very, very slowly. So you see the gradual, we can observe a gradual movement. We call this the slow moving sleep uh, phase. Of the uh, uh, of the slope, and of course along the propagation during the propagation of the theatric surface, you see a different su a surface substance at different locations. But that probably is introduced by the, some sort of boundary 
uh, uh, conditions because you on this observe, uh, uh, observer's glass, you see this is a, has a much less friction. So you see this surface acceptance uh, that is happening here. So, um, but however, that slope moving slate is global. And you can see them happening here, and it's covering the uh, the, the the sensors that, that uh, two, a set of sensors that were placed right outside of the slope at the at the toe area, right outside of the slope. And so, as you can see here, um, after the slow moving process, after slow moving sleep, if you continue, um, here I'm showing you the the, the, the sensor data. Uh, the, the sensor data. So here is uh, I want to show you this acceleration uh, phase here because it probably uh, better characterize what is happening. It's easier to see because it only has one curve uh, or one line. So here you have the initial acceleration, and we're not doing anything. We're just trying to let the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 surface to sorry let the the the, uh, the the model slope to to consolidate, and then also we started the, the, the seepage very very slowly, and then uh, we're spinning at this. Uh, around the 50 G to let the saturation, uh, to let the propagation of the phreatric surface to occur. And then we do that very slowly because we don't want to uh, disrupt the, uh, the, 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 the stability of the slope. And then when that finally happens, and when that finally the propagation of the phreatric surface reaches the toe area, and you see this immediate uh, onset of the initial slow moving sleep, when you started to move very, very, very slowly, and at that time, once we stabilized our uh, centrifuge uh, uh, acceleration to 100, uh, 100 G, at that time, if you increase the influx, which means that if you continue to increase the groundwater level, and that's what they do in the field due to irrigation. If you introduce a groundwater uh, influx here, that will cause flow slide immediately after we stopped it here. So you introduce an influx and you stop and it causes a flow slide. And if you look at it in terms of what happens in the, uh, uh, in the, the, the pore pressure transducer, and that is located right at sort of, this is the original location when we batted that in our slope. Of course, it's gonna, gonna move a little bit, but the approximation, uh, the, the assumption here is it will stay approximately uh, by moving along with the slope at this sort of the location still remain in the toe area. Obviously, we don't have the uh, exact location until we stop the test and uh, dig, the sample, uh, dig the sensors out. But, but the approximation here is that they will stay roughly and travel along with the slope, so stay in the toe area. And what happens, you can see here, in, uh, so the red line here is shows the ratio between the pull pressure and the total stress. And you can see this were, uh, exceeded the one and even 1.5. And you see this, this ratio is large. When you, when, you, when you see liquefaction, usually around one, it's pretty significant. And now what exactly we, we, we are observing here, 1.5. So it turns out what happens here, if you look at other sensors data, the, 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 this, this onset or the development of liquefaction that we observed here was not just the, uh, the increase of pore water pressure along that made this to happen. It was also, uh, landslide is a dynamic process. What happens during the landslide, you are actually losing, on top of this sensor, you are losing confining stress as landslide moves. So this is a propagating effects or a compounding effects of both increasing pore water pressure, changing of drainage condition, as well as reducing confining stress as landslide start to move. And therefore you will see uh, different individual events of liquefaction happening at the approximately the same location as the landslide develops or as the initial phase of the landslide develops. So uh, now in terms of this geometry idea, uh, this, is, uh, this has been already tested by, uh, by Andy Take at Queens um, back in his 2014 paper. And, uh, um, there was uh, it, it, it was uh, it was a very interesting read. I really enjoyed reading his paper on this one. So it was uh, his idea was basically if we make a infinite slope and probably won't liquefy, but if we make a base at the end of the infinite slope, then this zone becomes really saturated and this can cause base liquefaction. So that that's what happens in a nutshell. But it's so much more complicated than that. I'm just giving the uh, uh, overview of what uh, what that. Uh, test was telling us. 
And so, and also, uh, don't forget, we still have a drainage to undrain the transition that we believe is the key to the development of those flow slides. It's difficult to show that uh, that occurred in the centrifuge uh, model, but we do believe that it still played a part of that. And then, so we try to use the, uh, the numerical model to simulate what happens. So once you, we're introducing this K0 value to basically to, uh, to, to tell you how much the sample has been sheared along the drain loading path. The, so the smaller the K0, the, the longer it has been sheared along the drain path. And then you switch to on drain. You will see the very, very immediate or rapid reduction in strength once switched to the on drain loading. And the, the longer you travel the, during the drain the process, or the, during the drain loading pass, the faster or the more intense you will observe a switch to the critical or you kind of downturn to the, uh, to the critical state line when you switch to on drain, which is not difficult to understand because a lot of the strength has been mobilized during the, during the drained uh, shearing process. You see that this brittle failure has, has occurred. Of course, the metastable structure of the lowest itself contributes to the development of the flow slide, particularly in terms of the intact soil. Um, uh, and I should uh, also emphasize here, the centrifuge was actually based on reconstituted soil. Uh, uh, we, um, because in that way, we can better uh, implement the, the sensors. And so uh, if our understanding from the experimental data was correct, the intact is more susceptible to liquefaction than the reconstituted. So if the reconstituted are demonstrating this sort of behavior, then in the field, the intact may only appear to be more susceptible and you probably observe a more likely uh, 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 the, this, this, this possibility of uh, flow liquefaction. So uh, in conclusion, um, so basically what we, talk, what we talked about today is the effect of structure and which can either facilitate or impede the onset of flow liquefaction depending on the state of the soil, i.e. The, the water ratio and the stress level. And we also find that using constitutive model can really help us to gain an insight to compare uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the intact and reconstitute the soil to understand the effect of structure. And we, uh, we, we, we showed that the modified state parameter can probably better characterize and better predict flow behavior than just using the state parameter alone if you want to gain uh, additional set of information in terms of whether you have a, a flow, non-flow, or somewhere in the middle, you have a temporary flow instability. Um, state parameter will not give you a specific range to tell you what that happens and when that will happen. So, um, and also we've learned that the, 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 wet indu the wet induced sedimentation can effectively remove the effect of structure based on, based on in terms of the small strain uh, stiffness, that measurement. And, and, and we see that the, uh, the liquefaction or the flow liquefaction might not be developed along because of the, because just of the, uh, the increase of pore pressure. And also there's a compounding effect of the stress reduction or the confining stress reduction during the movement or the early phase uh, 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 or the initial movement of the landslide can contribute to that failure as well. And, uh, um, here, I just want to acknowledge the, uh, the collaboration and also the help that I've received when I was doing this, uh, uh, when I went to, visited the field uh, of this landslide in China, and also when I did the experiments and, uh, in, um, in, in both in China and in Atlanta, uh, the US. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Albert, for that presentation. I think they, I learned a lot of things there. Um, it's interesting to see how some of this could be applied to tailings. And I think uh, there's a lot of applications for maybe some of this work. Um, it sounds like you've spent quite a bit of your career studying this. So <laughs> This uh, cost about, the, uh, I think this is 60% of my PhD right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we have a, a time for maybe one or two quick questions. I think uh, Vivian is, do we have the chat open as well? Maybe uh, Vivian, if you just want to read them or, or if you can oh, see them, Albert, yeah. I, I don't have them on my end. Uh, it's okay, I can, I, I can actually read the, the questions here. So uh, one of the questions here is that, uh, how did uh, you? Uh, how did I use the, the, the high-speed camera to visualize the movement of the slope? 
and you use the tracer particles to uh, measure the movement of the slope and what is the frame rate and the pixel of the high speed camera. So um, unfortunately, because of the, uh, uh, the limitation of the facility, uh, the centrifuge modeling facility, I, uh, they, um, they, they, were, they, were, uh, they were very reluctant for me to, uh, uh, to place any, even the color tracer in the soil. And, and you can see that the, the lowest is a very monocolor, uh, uh, is a very monocolor slope. Um, if you go back to the uh, the, the figure on synthesis, the centrifuge model here, and they see, unfortunately, it's a very monocolor uh, slope, and then they did not allow me to do any uh, uh, tracer, um, so uh, or even just uh, dye different layers, and um, um, so I couldn't use any PIB to provide any reliable analysis over the uh, um, over that movement. So everything that I can was doing the image analysis, as you can see here. Uh, to uh, to the uh, to 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 basically uh, reflect or uh, 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 to draw the profile draw the profile of the the theatric surface because since there's a clear uh, mark of change of color uh, on the uh, on the theatric surface so that's the best that we could do at that time and uh, so the um, um, uh, I think that answered the, the the first two questions so what is the frame rate I think it was. 120 pictures per, uh, I want to say, sorry, 60 pictures per second, 60, 60 pictures per second. And, uh, um, and the pixel of the high speed camera, I don't remember uh, about that part. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, hope that answers your questions. Um, um, feel free to, uh, uh, to follow up with another one um, if you have. And, so we have a, another question here. So um, how did I introduce the writing process? Ah, the, the writing process for the, uh, I believe you were referring to the, the, uh, to the small screen uh, stiffness measurement uh, in the odometer test. Um, the sample was not initially wetted. The sample was an intact sample. It was air dried and it was, it was retrieved from the field. It was unsaturated at the very beginning, very low water content in the, in the uh, in the, um, it was a very, it, it is a, the, the, the entire area is a very dry area. So that when the sample was retrieved, uh, about 19 meter in depth, and it was an unsaturated uh, 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 sample. So the water content in the field is less than 8%. It's, so it's, it's very unsaturated. And it was air dried on, uh, during the transportation uh, um, between from when, when it was shipped from China to the US and then stayed in our lab for. Um, for approximately six months before the test was actually uh, um, started. So it was air dried. And uh, um, so yes, there is a similar drop, between, uh, same as the, the VP and the VS. And, and you can see that the, in, uh, the, the very sharp reduction in the void ratio, the very sharp in, in, uh, the, in the reduction of the void ratio. Uh, the, the wetting, uh, the wetting is the, the wetting is essentially the cause of the dissemination because when 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 lois is is wetted the the, the interparticle bonds which the, the, the Chinese lois that I studied here uh, presented in this presentation uh, was primarily bonded uh, by salt <clears throat> and it's a dissolvable when that, so when that happens when when water is being injected into that sample and um, uh, quickly you can see the uh, the, uh, the 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 um, the the, uh, the the water ratio reduction on your odometer uh, uh, test, you can see that the vertical deformation just happening in uh, pretty much immediately after you start you after you start to inject the water. So I I don't I don't think it has a uh, I think it has a very strong effect uh, to the to the dissemination. I think it is the prime is the cause of the dissemination and leads to the uh, leads to the the, the, the subsequent water ratio uh, reduction. And what's the capacity of this centrifuge? This centrifuge has the capacity of, I think the maximum was 500, uh, but I never really spin it that high. And then I don't think they were, <laughs> they were wanting me to spin that fast. <laughs> I, I did it was 100, yeah. Great, thanks for all the questions and uh, all those detailed answers, Albert. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and your excellent presentation and um, we're out of time here, but I do want to just take a few more seconds of everybody's time to share our next month's event. Um, 
and uh, I'll stop sharing right here. Thank you. Okay, our next event is actually a partnership with the Canadian Society for Civil Engineering, the Edmonton chapter. Um, it will be a geotechnical orient uh, geared topic about the Chase Center in San Francisco. So this is a $1.4 billion US project that was constructed uh, as the new home for the Golden State Warriors. And uh, there should be lots of interesting discussions about foundations, supported excavations, groundwater, and building on reclaimed land. So uh, watch your inboxes and we will share that with the GSE membership once registration information becomes available. Um, thank you for everyone's time and thank you again to Albert for his excellent presentation. And thank you to Vivian at the U of A for helping to coordinate the Zoom meeting. We'll see you next month, hopefully. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much.